Hey, this is His Word Unveiled. We're continuing in the book of Esther. Excited for today. Oh my goodness, this story. It's so, so good. There is so, there's so much truth, so much power in these few chapters that we're reading today. So let's get to it. Esther chapters three, four, and five. They're both kind of short. They've got tons and tons of truth in them. So let's jump in. Let's follow this story. When we follow this and we get what's going on, oh my goodness, the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the goodness of God, the way that he works just in his righteousness is so like shut up legit. So let's go for it. Let's not waste any time. Um, Man, all that we do, every second, every moment that we take, I'm declaring that God will be glorified. I am declaring that His Spirit is going to be poured out, that revelation will take place, that we will be changed, that things will be stirred up within us, that that we will encounter the living God, that we will hear Him speaking, that we will be moved. Let's just go for it. So Esther chapters three, four, and five, um, do your reading, take your time, take as long as you need, really just mark things up, take notes, really sit on it, listen to the Lord, cannot wait for what he has for us today. So we're going for it, you're reading, I'm praying, and and we're going to do this thing together. Lord, we love you and we thank you for just being so powerful, so strong, so mighty. Lord, you are a God who sees all, you can do anything, Lord, you make every impossible situation absolutely 100% possible. Lord, we just pray for those miracles. We just pray that we see this story of Esther. We see it just in the details of it, just all strung out, yet so intimately connected, just entwined so tightly where we see, where we know, where we walk away from from after reading this book, Lord, the book of, of Esther, and just knowing, being so assured of what you are capable of doing, of how you work, of how you see, of how you move, of how you defend, of how you use us, of how you you speak to us. Lord, I pray that it awakens us, that we get a newness and a freshness in understanding that truth and understanding who you are and understanding how intimately involved you are in our lives and in every step lord we can we can plan and strategize but you've got it and you're leading and you're directing and you're tweaking things and moving things and blocking us and opening doors for us and 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 father thank you for just being so at work just just a god of movement a god of powerful movement lord we love you and we thank you for loving us that your love is poured out through all of that movement, through all that power in the way that your mighty hand is at work. Lord, thank you for being who, for being who you are, for just wanting to work in our lives, for wanting that, that, um, that intimacy to take place in our lives, wanting us to see how at work you are. Lord, we love you, and we just pray that you enlighten us today. You teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. I'm excited. Esther chapter three. Let's go for it. Okay, we finished off just talking about um, Esther. Of course, that first chapter was Queen Vashti. The second chapter was this whole process of Esther being chosen and brought into the king, how she um, obtained favor in the eyes of all women, all men, in favor of the Lord. At the very end there, we saw that what Mordecai did in saving the king's life and speaking and um, exposing this plan to kill the king. It was written down in a book where I said is important and we will read about that later. Not in this video, but we've got to keep that fresh in our minds. So let's jump to chapter three. Starts off with verse one. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman. So here comes Haman. He's the bad guy. He's the villain of the story. And, and it ain't no joke. Like his villainous-ish stuff is no joke. So, um, man, let's learn about this cat. Let's learn about, about the righteousness of God and what ends up with him. So we know that Haman, this villain, bad guy, is promoted after Esther becomes queen. So that whole process, God had that, God covered that, God allowed that to happen, appointed her as queen, and now Haman is promoted. Now, what we know about Haman right away is continuing in that first verse, the son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. So he's like pretty powerful. He is appointed pretty 
high up in power. We know that he is the son of this Agagite or Agagite. Um, Agagite, we can um, know that, that terminology better by speaking Amalekite. So it's one in the same. Agag, this Agagite, Agag was the king of the Amalekites. So this goes clear back to Exodus chapter 17, uh, 14 through 16. And I'm going to flip there and we're going to read this. So um, just to get a feel for who Haman is and, and how bad of a dude he is and where he comes from, what, um, what family line he came from and why that's significant. So Exodus chapter 17, verses 14 through 16, those last verses of the chapter. Then the Lord said to Moses, write in this, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek, of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation, that it will continue. Then, um, just to refresh our minds a little bit more of this whole concept of Amalekites and now reading about this Agagite, uh, going into 1 Samuel chapter 15, where it talks about Saul being king. He's already screwed up. The Lord already told him that, hey, your kingdom is going to be torn from you. But then in verse 15 or chapter 15, he says, okay, you're still anointed king. You had this punishment. This was spoken against you, but I've anointed you king and I'm giving you another chance. And that is the chapter where he says, utterly destroy the Amalekites. Utterly destroy them. Don't spare a single one. Remove them. Get rid of them. That I want no one lasting. No one still living after this. So in that chapter 15, Saul was instructed to do that. And through our reading, we, we read that he spared Agag the king of the Amalekites, that he got rid of a lot of, a lot of the useless things. He kept the best of the sheep, the best of the cattle, and he spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites. This is huge. So in his disobedience, we see that Agag was spared. Now, at the end of that chapter, um, what needed, you know, taken place, Samuel came in and said, look, this is what God commanded, that this dude is supposed to be dead. And so Samuel came in and killed him. But we saw even in that, that disobedience, we see God, what he spoke, what he spoke in Exodus, what he spoke in 1 Samuel saying, these dudes are bad, that you are to utterly destroy them, that they are not to have a part in this. They are not um, to have a part in anything. And the Lord spoke and said that, that they, um, he will blot them out, that there will be this war against them from generation to generation. And we see that even now in the book of Esther towards the end of the Old, um, the, the Old Testament. So in this, we know that this, this line, the seriousness of God saying, I'm against them, you know, utterly destroy them for from a generation to generation, I will be against them, I will be upon them with judgment, um, all of these things spoken, that, that, there's an intensity of being against the Amalekites, of being against Agag and, and his people, against his ruling, against what he, what he does. Um, Agagite, then, we see that Haman is coming from, is, is coming from this family line of Agag, of the Amalekites, um, also known as the Agagites. So that's just a quick history of all of that, um, but knowing the intensity of this, knowing that God said there would be war between them from generation to generation, and here's war. And we'll learn as we continue in this story how serious of a battle that that Haman, begin, that Haman begins, of, of what he what he steps in and the decree that's made because of his anger, because of his pride, because of all of this, that he truly is an enemy of God's people, the enemy of the Jews. So with that, in that, we've got to hold tight to that and know, know the seriousness of this. This isn't just some bad guy. This is a bad guy who has a past. He has a history of this coming from a family line where the curse needed to be broken and it wasn't. And that violence and that kind of against the people of God is still the spirit that Haman is holding to. So as we read, we'll, um, we'll understand that more and more. So verse two, we know that Haman then is promoted into power, high power. Verse two, all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why are you transgressing 
the king's command. Why would you not listen to this command? Why would you not uh, bow down and pay him homage or honor um, Haman? Then in verse 4, we see, Now it was when they spoke daily to him, and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So they're bugging him. They're saying, why aren't you paying um, homage? Why aren't you bowing down? Why aren't you honoring Haman? Mordecai wouldn't listen. And it says that he expressed to them that he was a Jew. So they went to Haman and said, hey, does this dude's like, does this stand? Like, like, is this legit? Would this, would this stand in court in a sense that he says he's a Jew, so he's not bowing down to you? So we know that Mordecai, again, what he instructed Esther to do, we saw in the last video, not to go in and announce, hey, I'm a Jew and this is me and not to make that known, not to to be boastful about that and announce it. But when he was questioned, he spoke and he was clear with, hey, I am a Jew. And with this understanding and how it, how it was written and saying, I'm not bowing down. I'm a Jew. I'm not bowing down to you to show this honor to homage. Almost this awareness that Mordecai had of Haman being the son of an Agagite and knowing the history of that and knowing that the Amalekites and God's people go way back that seeing him as you are not worthy to be given honor, to be given this respect, and knowing, almost this awareness that, that he knew that the Amalekites, um, Agag, the king of the Amalekites, that what was spoken against them was utterly destroyed them, that God wanted them blotted out, completely destroyed. So because of this, because of Mordecai's response or lack of response to pay him um, homage, it says that Haman was filled with rage. We see that in verse 5. He was filled with rage. Um, but through this rage, it says that Haman didn't want to lay his hands only on Mordecai, but he found out more of Mordecai and understanding that he brought up that he was a Jew. So now Haman is not against Mordecai, but against all of the Jews. His entire um, family of people being against the Jews. And it says in verse 6, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews the people of Mordecai who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So all those who were in the kingdom of Persia, Haman was seeking out to destroy. Now in verse 7, we see that King Ahasuerus cast lots for when this would take place. Before he approaches the king, he cast lots. So again, you know, relying on this, this divination, these things of we're going to cast lots and whatever it falls on. Now, this is so cool that no matter you know, who's casting lots, no matter what kind of divination is brought out, the Lord decides. He has the final say every time, even when these things are used and even when these things take place. This takes us back to Ezekiel. We can remember in um, chapter 21, verse 21, where the king of Babylon, remember the two sieges took place and the king of Babylon comes with this fork in the road and he uses divination to know who to attack. Do I attack the sons of Ammon? Or do I attack Jerusalem? So hopefully you remember that. Hopefully that's that's coming back. But this is a lot of what that is. And it took me back there and just thinking that like, okay, the king of Babylon was relying solely on this divination to of this sorcery and this this kind of stuff that that would give him an answer, that would give him clarity for, for the future and, and who he needed to attack at this fork in the road. God had the final say. God knew what he was doing. God led um, the king of Babylon in that time to attack Jerusalem being that third siege because what the Lord declared years earlier was that that third siege would happen in captivity that that the um that that Judah Jerusalem would be taken into captivity God has the final say this you, you can do whatever you can use whatever but God's got it God God uh, appoints things God leads it's it's his final say he decides and he causes it to happen there is no form of, of sorcery or power that is stronger than, than the might and power of our God. He decides. We can plan as much as we want. We, we, can, we can figure things out as much as we want, but God has the final say. So in this, King Ahasuerus cast lots to find out when this is going to take place. Well, God knew exactly how long it needed to take place. Verse 8. God had a purpose in this. Verse 8, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of all other people, and they do not observe the king's laws. So it is not in the king's interest to let them remain. So 
Haman comes at King Ahasuerus with understanding what the lot fell on, more, you know, understanding what God had already ordained, it had nothing to do with these lots. It would happen this way, regardless of if he cast lots or not. But where the lots were cast at, what it revealed was that in 11 months, this decree of, of killing the Jews would take place. God gave them time. God knew that it would take 11 months for this to be, for everything that he had purposed already and established to take place in that time. That lot was not, when it was cast, it was not going to fall on one month or two months from then or five months from them. God knew it needed to be 11 months from that time, almost a year. So he approaches King Ahasuerus and says, look, there's these people and, and it is not in your interest to let them remain. So verse nine, if it is pleasing to the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who carry on the king's business to put into the king's treasury. Haman is saying, I'm going to pay all this money. Let's let this happen. Let's kill these people because they're not benefiting you in any way. And in fact, they're going to cause you harm. They're going to get in the way of your glory, your majesty, and all of your riches. Haman's anger and hatred cost him much. He doesn't even realize. He does not fully find out until it's too late of how much this is going to cost him. It's not just about the 10,000 talents of silver. It's going to cost him a whole lot more. So verse 10, then the, the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman and the son of Hamidatha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the silver is yours and the people also to do with them as you please. So the king says, okay, yeah, I like this. I don't want anything standing in my way of, of, of growing and benefiting and becoming successful. Yeah, go ahead and kill those people off, whoever you're talking. It's your money. If you want to put that money in, sure. Yeah, you spend it. You put it where you, you deal with it the way that you see fit. Verse 11. Um, we just said verse 11. Verse 12. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. So they all got together. They're coming up with this decree. Verse 13, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old women and children in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, to seize their possessions as plunder. So this decree is written. These letters are sent out saying that in one day, on one day, all of the Jews would be attacked and killed and they could do nothing about it. This decree is to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews in one day. On one day, they would all be wiped out. Haman went to the king. The king said, yes, let's do it. Gave him his signet ring. It's in writing. It has the king's signet ring plastered on it and it is sent out. Verse 14, a copy of the edict to be issued as law in every province was published to all the peoples. Then it said that Haman went to the king. They sat down and had a drink while all of Persia was just confused and they were worked up. And these Jews that are hearing this are freaking out. So this takes us into chapter four. It says that Mordecai then learned. He read this letter. He found out what was going on and he put on sackcloth and he is weeping and wailing out on the streets along with so many of these Jews. There's just a, a chaotic um, time mourning and wailing of these Jews that can do nothing, that they are hearing that in less than a year, they will be attacked. And in one day, they will all be wiped out. All of those Jews in that province, in, in the land of Persia. So Esther then hears this and it says in verse four, the queen writhed in great anguish. She sent Mordecai garments, take this sackcloth off and wear these. And Mordecai refused. And she said, okay, I need to find out why, what is going on? And Mordecai then sends her this, sends her the edict and says, look, the Jews are going to be destroyed. Mind you, Queen Esther is a Jew herself. So Mordecai then lets Esther know what's going on. And then he says, um, he says, and to order her. So he sends a message back, gives her this copy, lets Esther read it. And then he says, um, he orders her. He, in this, in this message that he sends back to her, letting her know what's going on, and then also orders her to go into the king to implore his favor and to plead with him for her people. Verse nine, Hathat came back and related Mordecai's words to Esther. Then Esther spoke to him and gave a reply to Mordecai. Mordecai says, I am ordering you to go into the king, implore his favor, plead with him for the Jews. And Esther responds and says, 
Look, all the king's servants, this is verse 11, and, and the people of the king's provinces know that for any man or woman who comes to the king to the inner court who is not summoned, he has but one law, that is to be put to death unless the king holds out to him the golden scepter that he may live. So Esther is saying, whoa, you want me to do what? You're ordering me to go into the king and implore him his favor to save the Jews? Esther says, everyone knows what would happen to me if I did that. Everyone knows that if I'm not summoned, if the king doesn't ask for me and I walk in there, just like that, I can be put to death. She said, unless he lifts out his golden scepter, unless he does that, just like that, I can be put to death if I am not summoned. Then, um, and she says, and I have not been summoned. Okay, so they're passing these messages back and forth. Verse 13, then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Okay, verses 13 and 14 really just grabbed a hold of me. And, and it really gives this message of we have got to start taking our choices seriously. We have got to start seeing the way that we live our life and every choice that we make. It is life or death. It truly is. We have got to start choosing and making these decisions, being eternally minded. We've got to start taking them seriously. When Mordecai replies to her and says, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. He is saying, you're a Jew, Esther. Wake up and see what's going on. He's not saying, hey, you're not, you know, it wasn't this like snarky remark saying, hey, don't just think that you're doing this for us. You're doing this for yourself too. It was more of, Esther, you've got to think of this. You're expressing this fear to me that if you go in, that, that he, could, he could declare your death right then, that you could die if you go in not being summoned. But Mordecai is saying, you've got to think, you've got to think deeper than that. You've got to think of the end result of this, that if you don't go in, you will die. It's, this really grabbed a hold of me and, and really made me think like when we, when we have decisions or when we're going through a really hard time or when we're, when we're called to forgive someone who honestly doesn't deserve our forgiveness or when we're called to love someone who is such a jerk or when we're called to, to go do something that's hard or that's going to take a lot of time or that's not convenient or when we're just, when, when life gets really, really hard and, and we start fearing, you know, we, we fear, we have this fear of insecurity or we have this fear of, of, of whatever, of not, of not being loved or this fear of losing something or this fear of, of failing or, or when we get wrapped up in fear, we get so caught up in that very moment of fear. When, when I feel, when the Lord just hit me personally reading through this and saying, stop focusing on this present, what you're afraid of. Let's think of what's ahead. Let's think of the ultimate result of this. Let's think of what really matters. That we can't get hung up on being anxious and worried and fearful on these decisions that we're called to do. On these decisions of, of knowing what's right of knowing what's good, of knowing that what's full of God's peace. We can't get caught up on, on fearing what's presently before us. When we have got to cling to the fear of the Lord and understand the, the, the seriousness of if we don't do this, what this means. If we don't do this thing that God is calling us to do, that he's stirring up within us, if we don't do this, the fear that that will cause, the fear of that disobedience will bring, the impact and the effects of that. That's what we need to be, in a sense, fearing. That, that we know that God's perfect love, it casts out all fear. There's no fear in the things that we do with the Lord and being connected to Him. But we've got to kind of shift our idea of fear that when we get into a situation where we don't want to do something or we're afraid to do something or we're really fearful that it won't work out or anxious and we get worried about things, we have got to bring ourselves back and focus in on what the Lord is saying and who he is and, and how he's called us and qualified us to do things and saying, I may be afraid to do this right now, but we've got to start fearing if we don't do it. We've got to start fearing if we disobey. We've got to start fearing the Lord, knowing knowing the, the, the seriousness of when he calls us to do something, what it means. And when he calls us out to do something, it's not just, hey, in that moment for us, 
We have no clue who it's for. We have no clue the souls that could be impacted, the, the matter of like eternal difference. When God calls us to do something, we've got to get out of our own zone and our, out of our own emotions and and thinking that it's no big deal and thinking light of a situation that we've got to take this seriously and know that if God's calling me to do it, the way that God works, what he's after, it's not just wasting time. He doesn't just do it like busy work. When he calls us, it matters and it means something and it holds eternal significance. And it's a matter of a life or death. We've got to come back to that. I got so convicted reading this and just and letting God just overwhelm me in that and saying we have we've got to rise up in those moments. And we have got to to speak against that fear and that anxiety and saying, you know what, I'm not going to get caught up on what is presently before me, on these emotions that I'm feeling. I'm going to move in obedience knowing that that the, the results could be so much worse if I say no to this or if I deny this or if I avoid this or if I take light, um, if I make light this situation of what God's calling me to do. It's serious. And when Mordecai says that, when he says, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. That's what I hear him saying that. And saying, get out of this fear of, of what if I do this. And get into this, th this idea of what if I don't do this? What if, what if I don't obey the Lord? Who's going to be impacted? Who's, who's eternal? How is it going to impact people eternally? That's where we need to go with this. That, that, that should drive us into being obedient, into to pursuing, into seeking the Lord daily, every day of our lives. If we don't do that, how is that going to impact the rest of the world? How many people are going to remain lost and just, and just bound up in all of their stuff and being blinded to the truth? We've got to listen to the Lord and we've got to respond to what the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is calling us out to live and to be and to speak and to do and to just be found in Him. We have got to start, we've got to start thinking eternally and, and, oh man, and just, just taking it seriously. Okay. In that, and, and how he continues in verse 14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. I love this, where he says, look, God's going to move regardless. He, he's a God of movement. Now, God is not mentioned in this. This is what the Lord really spoke to me through Mordecai's words. This is what I'm hearing, that that, that God's going to move no matter what. And how silly, how foolish it would be if we deny his movement in the position that he's already done, in the movement that he's already done in positioning us where we're at. With Esther, I hear this, I hear Mordecai saying this, and look, either way, God's going to move. Either way, God's going to deliver and restore and do these things in so many people. But how foolish of you to, to think that God is an already movement, that that movement already isn't taken place by positioning you where you're at. And how he says, and who knows whether you have not obtained royalty for such a time as this, that it's here and now. How foolish it would be for you to deny the fact that you have been made queen for this moment, that there is purpose in this, that God saw you through, that God led you here to this and for this position right here and now. That again, we can't get overwhelmed with our fear in the situation that's before us. We have got to fear what is going to happen if we disobey the Lord. How that's going to impact. How that's going, just, just that, that. That we have got to get into this, that for such a time as this, that I am where I am at right now for a reason, for a purpose. We have got to open up our eyes and understand that God's got us and he's leading us. And in anything that's before us, he's got it. And we are right where we're at with, with where we're at, with what we have. We can be obedient and we can be assured that God is moving and God is going to use us. And there is purpose in our position of where we are at right now. So for such a time as this, you are here. And he calls Esther out on this to see that, to be awakened to that purpose. When we understand the purpose on our lives and we understand that there's purpose in where we are at, in the season of life that we are in, that it is wrapped fully with purpose. That God's not saying, oh, you, you know, you've got a really big purpose on your life as soon as you're done with this. No, there's purpose right here, right now. And when we understand that purpose, that we are never where we are at just by chance. It, we're not, there's purpose in every moment of our lives. It's not by chance. Then the way becomes clear. When we understand that, the way before us becomes clear. And what we need to do 
it becomes clear where we're not sitting around saying, oh, what do I do? I don't want to mess up. God, where you just tell me. And we get so wrapped up in our emotions and our anxiety and our fear in that where it's just like we can we can be assured and we can know that God is just going to make clear the way. When we say, you know what, there's purpose and my purpose is to know the Lord and to follow him and to hear his voice. And when we get this and, and we allow his spirit and his voice to just arise within us, then, then that way is made clear. Then we see so much clear and the urgency to move, it's strong. And God just takes us. When we say there's purpose in this, no matter what the result is, there's purpose in this. Then we see we see that Esther is kind of awakened to this, this purpose. And in verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maidens also will fast in the same way. So she goes through this fasting. She says, look, you guys fast. You, you guys pray, you guys do your thing, and I'm going to do the same thing, and we are going to let God do this. Now, God is not mentioned in, the, in this. Um, like we said, the whole book of Esther, the, the name of the Lord, God is not mentioned. But this, I love this, this just moving in this. Go assemble them. Let's let's do what matters. Let's, let's, um, let's recognize and respond to this purpose that we are in that God has given us in. So you go fast and I'm doing the same thing. And then she says, and thus I will go into the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. That this purpose, when we understand our purpose, when we understand why we were created, when we understand the power of God, when we understand that he's got us, when we understand that the most important thing that matters is our relationship with him, and our being obedient to him, and our connecting with him, and our hearing him and knowing him, being familiar with his voice, that, and just being covered and protected and and just surrounded in him, led in his righteousness. When we get that that's our purpose, a boldness just rises up within us. And we say, you know what? If I perish, I perish. Because I'm living life. I'm doing what matters. And I'm, I'm being connected to that purpose. And I'm willing to respond to that purpose. And she says, if I perish, I perish. Verse 17, so Mordecai went away and did just as Esther had commanded him. Love that in verse 17. It's almost like the tables are turned, that Esther has been trained for this moment, that she has been in in such grace and in such obedience and listening to Mordecai and really growing through that, being trained for this moment as queen. And Mordecai just lets her fly, lets her soar in that. And it says, and Esther Um, He did just as Esther commanded. It's on. They're taking this seriously, and she's not doing this on her own strength. She says, I need all y'all fasting for me. I I need all of you all taking this just as serious as I am taking this. So let's do this. Let's make this count. Let's not do it in our own strength. Here we go. Okay, finishing up with chapter 5 then. So now it came about, it says, on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. So this is crazy. We just hyped all of this up, you know, saying, oh, but I know if I go in there, I'll die. And Mordecai replies and all these responses. And then Esther rising up, understanding her purpose. So all of this hyped up. Then we see that Esther puts on her royal robes. King Ahasuerus is sitting on his throne. Then in verse 2, here it is. When the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. This isn't a drawn out story. It's not a drawn out, ooh, what happens? Like, you know, does she die? Does she not? Does the king get angry? Does he not? It's so, we just see God's like to the point response of blessing. Like, like this is what happens. It says the king saw Esther standing in the court and she obtained favor in his sight. Just like that, just like that, she obtains favor. It's, it's absolutely amazing that, that God responds, God hears, God just does, God's moving. And when we're willing to see it and when we're willing to step out, we see that God's got us, that, that there's no drawn out anything, that it's just, he protects he defends, he moves, he's faithful, he's righteous, period. That's it. We don't have to go into this long, drawn out, you know, dramatic way of expressing it. It's just the king saw her and she obtained favor, just like, just like that. Okay, verse three. Then the king said to her, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? So he asked, he says, anything you want, 
anything, even to half the kingdom, it shall be given to you. So then she says, bring him, um, she says, bring Haman and, and you and Haman come to a banquet that I will prepare for you. So the king says, bring Haman quickly. We see this in verse five. Um, Esther's prepared a banquet for us. And, and so they go and he asks again, what is your petition for? It shall be granted to you, whatever you want, such favor. And this is not the king and his kindness and showing your favor. This is God knowing this, driving this, you know, establishing this, like he and his thought, he's got this whole thing worked up and the king is so, so receptive, so just giving, just pouring out favor to Esther. What is it that you want? Anything. And so Esther replies, she says, my petition and my request is in verse seven, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and do what I request, may the king and Haman come to the banquet, which I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king says. So she got him there at the banquet. He asks again and she says, okay, my request, I will let you know what it is I want. Come tomorrow to um, another banquet, the second banquet that I will have for you and Haman. Verse nine, this finishes up talking about Haman. Then Haman went out that day, glad and pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai and the king's gate, and that he did not stand up or tremble before him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. So Haman is full of pride, full of arrogance. Now he just left this banquet that Esther invited him to and invited him back to his second banquet. So he is just I mean, it's, he's like maxed out in pride. He's maxed out in arrogance. And this leads him to hate all of those who do not think as highly of himself as he does. So because he's so full of himself, he's hating everyone who's not agreeing with him. He's not thinking, you know, like, oh, you're the greatest. You're, you're like wonderful, Haman. Like, I, I can't even imagine like anyone being even close to your power and your glory. And Haman, he's, he gets so enraged so hateful towards Mordecai, who doesn't stand up, he doesn't even acknowledge, he doesn't, he doesn't even budge, it doesn't even phase him, and this infuriates Haman. So it says that in verse 10, he controls himself and went to his house. He sent then for his friends and his wife, Zeresh. So he controlled himself, didn't attack Haman, didn't go at him. Um, he knows that this decree is set. He knows what's coming, you know, in 11 months. He knows that they're, they're about to die, but he gets so furious and he gathers everyone. It's gonna be a big gossip session and everyone's gonna know about this Mordecai and everyone's gonna know how great I am and how pathetic he is. How many times do we do that? Nobody wants to put themselves in, in the same shoes as Haman and say, hey, I've been there, but let's get real. Let, let's seriously get real and, and think of maybe times that we got so mad that people didn't give us credit or that people didn't see us or that people didn't acknowledge us. Um, this, th this is Haman. And then he wants to go tell everybody about it. He, he wants to say, can you believe this person? They think they're so much better or they did this and they did that against me, lifting themselves up and saying, I didn't deserve this. I can't believe they did this. Oh my goodness, guys, like that, we do not want to be like that. We see from the outside just how, how weighty, how restless, how, how ugly that kind of spirit is, that, um, that within Haman. So Haman gathers his friends and his wife, and he tells them all about his glory, everything he has, everything that's done. Hey, even the queen invited me, no one else, just me and the king, and she even invited me back to this next one and, and just sharing all of this. And then he says, after lifting himself up, talking about how great he is, then he says in 13, yet all of this does not satisfy me every time I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. Then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, have a gallows 50 cubits high made, and in the morning ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. And the advice pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. When we are out seeking to satisfy ourselves, we will never, ever be satisfied. We will never find satisfaction. When pride and selfishness are what drives us, we will never, ever be filled. We will never, ever find rest. We will always be striving and desperate and finding ourselves absolutely destroyed and bound up by all of that pride. So we see Mordecai is just ranting and raving, talking about himself and then saying, you know what? No matter how many people I have like me, it's not enough that I have this one person, Mordecai, this, this, this worthless Jew 
that this worthless Jew doesn't show me any respect. And so his wife and his friends, they're all talking and agreeing and saying, hey, just hang him tomorrow. Go to the king, make a gallows, build this gallows just for Mordecai and hit up the king and say, hey, you know, we need to have Mordecai. We're, we're going to crush him. We're going to talk bad about him. We're going to make him look bad like he needs to be hung, like he's a threat, like he's no good, like he's a nobody. And after building this, having this this 50 cubits high gallows, this huge thing, and being huge so that everyone can see. So his wife and friends are saying, oh, it bugs you that you're not being seen by him? Well, let's make sure that everyone sees how worthless Mordecai is. Let's let everyone see that anyone who doesn't show you that honor, what will happen of them? So he makes this crazy high gallows made just for Mordecai. Like this thing is large. This thing is huge for everyone to see. And he's going to go to the king and say, hey, let's have Mordecai hung. Then the wife speaks again and says, then go joyfully to the king, to the banquet. Then go have a great time. Then go let your spirits be lifted because you have harmed somebody else. How sad, how absolutely sad is that? And the fact that that advice pleased Haman. So he had the gallows made. So he's all prepared to have Mordecai then hung on these gallows that he made and to go to this banquet and everything be fine and him be honored the way he feels as if. This grieves my heart, especially, especially knowing that Haman's wife is the one speaking this to him. I choose to be a wife and a friend who will always speak boldly and love the truth, like the, the truth of God's word. Like, I don't wanna be speaking all of this junk into my husband or, or allowing him to feel like, like being so concerned about lifting my husband's name up before the name of the Lord. I'm going to be that wife who's always speaking boldly and confidently, not, not in any amount of hesitancy or reluctancy, speaking boldly in love, the truth of God's word, leading others in the awareness, in, in the awareness, leading my husband, helping my husband to see and to be aware and, and convicted to show him, to reveal to him and, and everyone that I give advice to, everyone that I counsel or mental, mentor, every, every word that comes out of my mouth, I wanna be leading them in this awareness and in this conviction of the grace and humility and the goodness of God. That's what I'm after. There's, I want purpose and life to be in every word that I speak. I will speak, I, I will speak life and truth, not speaking words and giving advice that empowers my flesh. I will be speaking the word of the Lord. I will speak, be speaking of his goodness. I will be speaking things that bring other people into life and not lead them, not lead them into to doing these destructive things that, that hold them bound, that blind them, that keep them away from truth and all of God's blessing and goodness. Um, and I vow to never, ever be like Haman's wife. Never, 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 never. Um, okay. There was so much information with that. So we leave off with that, that um, Esther saying, hey, tomorrow come back. Haman and the king are invited then to the second banquet that she has. We leave off with hearing that Haman had that gallows made. So tomorrow it's gonna be a big day for everyone, for Haman, for Mordecai, for Esther, for the king. It's gonna be a really big day in the book of Esther. So don't miss it. There's so much going on. So. Thanks so much for walking this out with me. Um, yes, I hope you're loving this book just as much as I am. And we're just at the beginning. Oh my goodness. What God does in this, so good. So thanks so much. I'll see you soon in my next video.